Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here. And I'm truly, truly honored to be here. Um, this is an amazing center that you run over here. Uh, I'm just, I was, it was mind blowing to see what you guys do. Uh, I think it could be a center of excellence and an example to other clinics everywhere else. You know, yesterday I was walking towards the Toronto General Hospital and I saw this huge glass tower. Um, I think it's the health, it's the cardiac it's health tower or something like that. Something to do with one organ in the body, just one heart. And I was hoping that one day we might take off that sign and put over there, EDS tower, <laughs> right? <laughs> If you need help, I can do that. I'm good at climbing ropes. <laughs> anyway, uh, so <clears throat> this is going to be a pretty long talk. And um, I, I believe it's being recorded, right? Um, so <clears throat> try and understand what I'm going to talk about. And you know, I'll be happy to answer any questions, because the whole purpose of you guys being here is if I help you understand, then you can go move forward and help your patients. Uh, so th these are the standard disclosures, and I have zero disclosures. Uh, no one's paying me. I'm not paying anyone. Uh, uh, Dr. Clark, sorry. So we'll get over that. So EDS is a very complex condition. And this presentation is about connecting those dots between all the symptoms that come with EDS. It's not just about the skin or the joints. There's, there's a lot more behind that. There's, if you drill deeper down, there's a lot more to see. So these are some of the conditions that uh, a patient with EDS presents with. Um, joint instability, POTS, tethered cord, mast cell, abdominal pain, carry, autoimmune dysfunction. And eventually all these, in some way or the other, feed into EDS or EDS feeds into them. And it's, if it was just plain for, straightforward EDS, it would have been an easy job. But this is, there are other things, other multifactorial things that we need to deal with. So let's talk a little bit about pain in general. How do you manage pain? The, the, the important thing to understand about pain is to understand what's broken, what's causing this pain. If you, anything else you do is, is a band-aid. So if you fix what's broken, that's when you make progress. For example, somebody with presenting with a shoulder joint pain, uh, it could be from a dislocated shoulder, it could be from muscle spasms or a nerve that's pinched, or it could be all of the above. Now the treatment for each one of these is different. There's no one uniform treatment. And so once we've, the trick here is to find out what's causing this pain, what's broken over here. Then comes the part about treatment. Uh, how do you manage treatments? And there's no one single treatment. You have to use a mix of treatments. Um, so for example, if someone comes in with knee pain due to instability, uh, one part of the treatment would be to stabilize the knee with braces. The other part might be to strengthen the muscles around the knee. The third part, part might be medications. Fourth part might be how to look, cope with pain and so on. I call this the 10% rule. And the 10% rule is that if you can get 10% out of one modality, 10 from another, 10 from another, and if you have five of these, you've got 50%. And as Dr. Clark pointed out, it's, it's what we're looking for is 50%. <clears throat> So what are the reasons that a patient with EDS will have pain? Loose joints can hurt. What happens is when there's a loose joint, the muscles around the loose joint tighten up. So now the muscles start to hurt. Loose joints can pinch nerves, and I'll show you examples of these. And so when they pinch nerves, we've got to figure those out. And then there's mast cell activation syndrome, which is the king of all conditions. That just makes everything worse. And then, of course, we have parts and dysautonomia that can add to the loss of function. Now, one, the one thing I wanted to point out was that joint surgery to help pain results in worsening of the condition, and I'll show you why. But the problem with it is that, you know, we have patients who've come in and said, you know, I had this subluxing shoulder joint, and then I went in there, and the surgeon tightened up the shoulder. But then a year later, they are worse than before, and the reason being that the native tissue is weak, and when you when you cut open native tissue and repair it, it becomes even weaker. And the classic example is to look at the scars in patients with EDS. They are all paper thin scars. That's the paper thin scar that these, the tissue heals with. So there are enough studies to show that joint surgery to help pain results in worsening the condition. Now, when I see a patient for the first time with EDS, I tell them four things. One is EDS is not a disease. I don't want you to think that you have some sort of a 
congenital fatal disease. It's just a form of the human body. There are tall people, there are short people, there are black people and there are white people. They all have their own set of medical conditions. For example, sickle cell anemia is more common in blacks. That doesn't mean being black is a disease. It's just that it's, this is the inherent nature of our human bodies. So having soft, so the other thing I tell them is that you, your tissue is soft. And it is, in some ways it's actually protective. So having soft connective tissue is nothing bad. It's not evil. Uh, they lose poor, they have poor joint position sense. They lose their joint, a sense of their joint position is called proprioception. And then the fourth one is they come with coexisting conditions and not every EDS patient presents with all of these coexisting conditions like mast cell, parts, or carry malformation. And I'll get into all of those later on. So I thought the best and the easiest way was to go through, um, talk about pain and different body parts from the top, head to toe. So let's go to the headaches. Uh, migraines are common and I won't dwell on migraines because migraines are common in general. Um, carry malformation, cervicogenic headaches, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, uh, POTS and dysautonomia, Dr. Maxwell is gonna talk about that. Uh, spontaneous CSF leak, that's low pressure, intracranial low pressure. Uh, cranial cervical instability, and then idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And I'm gonna to briefly touch on all of these to explain to you what they all mean. So a patient comes in, my whole head hurts, I see double and I can feel my heartbeat in my ears. My whole head hurts, I see double and I can feel the heartbeat in my ears. This is a, generally a symptom of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. In the old days, it used to be known as pseudotumor cerebri, and I think they took that term off because of the word tumor. Um, anyway, um, the, the reason for patients having this, and for some reason it's common in EDS, is because they have spinal stenosis. Uh, I'm sorry, they have stenosis of one of the veins in the head. Um, <clears throat> so they don't drain enough, and then they have intracranial, raised intracranial tension. They often present with double vision sensitivity to light. They have a pulsatile tinnitus, that's the one to remember, not just tinnitus, but it's a boom, boom, boom tinnitus. They, it's usually because of a venous sinus stenosis. Now, the diagnosis in general is a spinal tap, eye exam, and MR venography. I don't, not just me, but most of us are now starting to think that doing a spinal tap in patients with EDS is not a good idea. And there are two reasons for that. One is, um, if you do a spinal tap, on a patient with EDS, you're pretty much guaranteed to have postural puncture headache. So now instead of treating the headache, you've given them another headache to worry about. The second thing is that, <clears throat> you know, with spinal tap, we look at the opening pressure to see what the pressure is. But for some, one of the theories is that do these people have such flexible or such soft dura matter that the pressure range that we look at, the normal pressure ranges that we look at, do they apply to patients with EDS? And most often we've started to see that patients, you know, they do a spinal tap on a patient with suspected intracranial hypertension, their headache gets better, but the opening pressure is normal. And so there are universities and medical centers now in the US that don't believe in doing a spinal tap in patients with EDS. Eye exam, uh, you know, I get pushback because of the eye exam. Oh, well, we did an eye exam and it was normal, therefore the patient does not have intracranial hypertension. I'm sorry, but you don't want to wait for eye exam changes to happen. We need to fix that before it happens. Mm -hmm. So I guess the best way to treat, to look at it is the MR venography. Uh, and of course the treatment is, uh, once you find if there's a stenosis, then the best treatment is to go in for a stent. Um, if not, then um, a shunt. I, in my personal experience, and most patients or physicians have treated this, haven't found really great benefits from treating them with diamox, which is, um, <clears throat> a diuretic. So my next one is, uh, my headache gets worse when I stand and it almost goes away when I lie down. This is a classical Sam example of spontaneous CSF leak. So <clears throat> just to refresh your memory, this is the spinal cord. The CSF uh, flow is a closed compartment. And so now any outflow from any of this area will cause a drop in the pressure. And so the brain kind of becomes drops down and then there's an increase in pressure there. Uh, this is a classical example. These headaches get worse when they stand up, obviously. But the key question is, do they resolve when they lie down? And in CSF leak, 
it should resolve down to almost 100%. That's the key question. I generally ask them not 100%, but I said, do, do your headaches get better than more than 50% when you lie down? In chronic spontaneous CSF leak patients, now these are patients who may or may not have a history for a spinal puncture. So you may have patients who have never had a spinal puncture or an epidural or something and may still present with spontaneous CSF leak. So these headaches usually get worse by the end of the day. Uh, in long-standing cases, it's pretty much all day long. They do have nausea and vomiting and they have tinnitus, but it's not a pulsatile tinnitus. That's the thing to remember. Um, so the question is, well, there's another headache that comes along in, this, uh, in, in patients with POTS and they have the same thing. When they stand up, their headache gets worse. So I put a little graph to show you. Uh, the headache gets, um, so this is patients with CSF leak. These are patients with POTS. Um, the headache gets better in the CSF leak significantly, but in POTS, it's not significant. It's not a much of a change. I mean, they, anybody with a headache when they lie down feel, will feel better. Patients with dysautonomia do get better, but not as much. That's the key one. Their orthostatics in CSF leak are normal, but in POTS, they're off the chart. And then there's, and patients with POTS also have dizziness, which you don't see in CSF leak. So that's how you differentiate between uh, headaches uh, from a CSF leak in POTS. Uh, the management for CSF leak is to increase PO fluids and caffeine. Uh, you can either give them caffeine pills or caffeine IV. Uh, lots of fluids. Uh, the next one is to try an abdominal binder. Uh, and then a high volume epidural blood patch. And most of them actually require multiple patches. Uh, if that fails, then it's a directed uh, epidural fibrin glue. If all, if all else fails, then it's a surgical repair. Now surgical repair is only in patients who've already had spine surgery and there's a leak left over from there. Then surgeons will go back and do a dural flap. Um, so just to recap, my headache gets worse when I stand, it almost goes away when I lie down, is a spontaneous CSF leak. So the next headache is, my headache gets worse when I cough. I have tingling in my hands and feet, and I have difficulty swallowing. This is a classical headache from what is called as carry malformation. So just to recap what carry malformation is, that's the uh, brain and that's the cerebellum, this cabbage looking thing is, called, is cerebellum. Now, and that's the foramen magnum uh, and the brain stem and uh, comes out through that to become the spinal cord. In carry malformation, the, the fossa, the posterior fossa is, is narrow, shallowed or deformed in some way, which then pushes on the cerebellum, which then pushes down into the foramen magnum. This part of the cerebellum is called the tonsil. So the tonsil and the, and, and the, and the brain stem are squeezed through, this, through the foramen magnum. So now there's, pressure on the, on the on this brainstem. And those are symptoms of carry malformation. Now, the, the hallmark sign of carry malformation headache is headaches get worse with coughing and straining. Obviously, because what's happened is this used to be a closed compartment and now it's become an, this used to be an open compartment and now it's become a closed compartment because it's all jammed into the, into the foramen magnum. And so these patients, uh, when they cough and strain, there's an increase in the pressure inside the headache and they feel that. Um, they're classically, they have suboccipital headaches, uh, they have balance problems, uh, paresthesias, dizziness, and difficulty swallowing. Now, I just want to warn you, difficulty swallowing is not a hallmark sign. So there are other reasons why patients will have difficulty swallowing also. <clears throat> so how do you diagnose carry malformation? And here's the problem. Um, you need a good history and physical exam, of, of course. But the problem is that these patients need an upright MRI of the neck. And the upright MRI, why an upright MRI? Because their ligaments are loose and lax. So when, they, when they're upright, there's a cranial settling. So the, the skull actually settles down a little bit. And that's when they manifest their signs of carry malformation. And just to show you what I mean by that is this is an MRI in, in the supine position, same patient sitting position. And here's the cerebellum that you saw that's the that's the brain stem the foramen magnum is over here and if you look at the sitting mri you'll see how the brain, the cerebellum is starting to poke through into the foramen magnum and that's that's the difference between sitting and supine mris there's something called the cliboaxial angle the normal angle is about 140 degrees uh, and you can see this is pretty much normal in the supine position 
but it drops down, it becomes more acute uh, in cases of uh, an upright MRI. The, I, you know, in talking to people yesterday, I found out that there's no upright MRI center here. Um, back in the US, we have the same problem. There are not that many upright MRI centers, but again, you know, unless we don't talk about it, we'll never get it. So it's, you know, start the ball rolling, start the conversation. Maybe someday someone will listen and we'll get an upright MRI. <clears throat> so um, the problem is that, again, if you look at the literature, uh, there is an association between carry malformation, craniocervical instability, and tethered cord syndrome. In fact, the relationship between carry malformation and tethered cord syndrome is 66%. So 66% of patients with carry malformation may also have tethered cord syndrome. Um, <clears throat> so again, to recap, the headache gets worse when you cough, it, they have paresthesias and difficulty swallowing is carry malformation. So moving down to the neck, neck pain. Uh, my head feels too heavy to hold up. This is a very good example. You know, you ask them, they won't of course volunteer this information because they don't know it's supposed to be volunteered. Um, so my head feels really too heavy to hold up. You want to take it and leave it on the side. Um, we know that the neck is held together, the spine is held together by ligaments, which are then supported by muscles. But we depend on our ligaments heavily to hold our head up and the neck and the spine up. If your ligaments are not like rope, they're more like elastic bands, the neck, the joints of the neck are going to be very, very unstable. So excessive movement of the joints of the neck causes craniocervical instability. <clears throat> Now, this is to give you an example. By the way, I spent half an hour figuring out how to convert cent um, inches to <laughs> centimeters. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It was changing it on the slide. The conversion is easy. <laughs> I grew up with centimeters and kilograms, so I love it. But how do you change it on a slide was the hard part. But anyway, I managed to do it. So the normal head in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the anatomical position weighs about four and a half kilograms. So if your ears are lined up against your shoulder, which is the normal position, it's about four and a half kilograms. You move it forward by two and a half centimeters, it now becomes almost double, nine kilograms. And if you move it forward by another five centimeters, now it's three times, you know, and that's a lot of weight you're putting on your neck. Now, if that neck is not, is, is not stable, if it's, it's got elastic bands to hold it up, that's really going to worsen the craniocervical instability. And that's where I was talking about is where the head feels too heavy for the neck. So these patients present with neck pain, stiffness. The stiffness is because you know what happens is like when the ligaments don't work, so the, so the muscles take over that work. So the muscles tighten up. And these muscles, when they tighten up, they start to hurt, and that's where the stiffness comes from. They have headaches, dizziness. Now, these are the rest of them are very non-specific symptoms. Now, I just wanted to show you uh, what craniocervical instability looks like on an MRI. This is actually one of the better MRIs, and you can see how the brainstem is being squeezed over here. Uh, this this angle is called the Ma grab mapstone oaks measurement. And you can see how the, the spinal cord is, the brainstem is almost getting pinched over here. If this person were to get into us, even a fender bender, we would have a lot of trouble here. So um, this actually, sent the one, the MRI that, that, I, that I just showed you is part of what is called a cervical medullary syndrome, um, which is ventral brainstem compression. So the brainstem is being compressed ventrally over here. Uh, these patients present with uh, vision changes. Actually, there's a whole slew of conditions. I didn't want to put all of them here, but predominantly they have vision changes, dizziness, uh, changes in speech. Does they get dysphonia. They have difficulty swallowing. Remember, we talked about difficulty in swallowing with carry malformation also. They have balance problems. We talked about balance problems and carry malformation. So here you can see how the dots are being connected. And of course, they present with symptoms of POTS. Now, the question is, if a patient comes in with POTS, what are we going to do? Are we going to treat the cranial, look for cranial cervical instability, carry malformation? Are we going to look at what else Dr. Maxwell is going to talk about later on? So it's not a simple treatment over here when you come to treat dysautonomia. So the important part is how do you diagnose it? So uh, in terms of imaging, um, there's something called, so uh, if you're looking at something that's dynamic, 
getting a static picture is no use. So if I, if you take a picture of me standing like this, it makes no sense. But if you take a picture, a video of me scratching my head, now you know what that posture meant. So in digital, so one of the ways to do that is to do a, what is called a digital motion X-ray, DMX. Um, it's more like a fluoroscopy, but a higher grade fluoroscopy. And so you can see, uh, and you have the patient move their head up and down, and you can see the translation of the vertebra as they move. Um, if not, then you can get a functional um, CT scan in different positions, flexion, extension, and then rotation either way. And that will give you an idea of what's happening in these patients. Now, um, this, I'm not going to delve too much into these angles, but when you send in a patient for an MRI, ask for these angles. Neuroradiologists are not very happy about doing this because it's a lot of work doing it. Uh, but you need, do need these angles. They're called the cliboaxial angle, the Harris measurement, and the Grabs mapstone oaks measurements. And these kind of give you an idea as to how much is the, is the spinal cord being compressed over here from the craniocervical instability. Um, oftentimes, if the neuroradiologist doesn't do it, the neurosurgeon will do it. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of management, it's pretty straightforward. Um, in mild to moderate cases, you can start with neck strengthening exercises. You can use a hard cervical collar. Um, if in severe cases, then you talk about surgical fusion. Now, just a quick note on the hard. Here's an example of a hard cervical collar. This is one of the collars that I like. Um, it's called the Vista multi-post therapy collar. It's a little, it's, it's, it's got a little balloon in here. Um, you can't see it, but there's a little balloon in here. You pump it from here. See this little tube, you pump it up so it sort of adjusts to the contour of the face. Um, I don't obviously recommend wearing it when they're driving, but I do recommend that they wear it when they're in a car as a passenger um, because you don't want a little fender bender or a little accident or a little slip and fall um, causing more harm. The other type that's, uh, that's very popular is called the Miami J cervical collar. Um, so moving on to temporomandibular joint pain, the, the TM joint, this joint, is inherently a very unstable joint. There are very two unstable joints, the TM joint and the shoulder joint. And this is a really unstable joint. Uh, the reason being that we needed to move up and down and side and side to side so we can chew. Um, it's a very common condition in just in the general population, non-EDSs also, and patients present with pain uh, to the, they present with basically headaches, facial pain, neck pain, upper back pain, and even in some cases, if you look at the literature, even low back pain. Um, these are very closely related to neck issues. Uh, patients often, when asked, they'll tell you that they clench and grind. Uh, they have pain with chewing. Their jaws kind of dislocate all the time and they sublux when they eat or yawn. Um, so at this, when I come to, you know, obviously the treatment for TMJ pain is to look at what, what the orthodontist will create, what is called a oral appliance, which instead of chomping on your teeth, they, you chomp on air. And that's how you prevent damage to your uh, joints. So um, just wanted to quickly touch on dental issues and EDS. They're extremely common because again, the gums are connective tissue, the teeth are connective tissue. So very often these patients are, have weak and thin enamel, they're prone to cavities. We call them soft tissue, uh, soft teeth. They have uh, gum weakness, gingivitis, all sorts of gum issues, because that's again, connective tissue. Now the difference, remember in EDS, connective tissue is easy to damage, but it's also difficult to heal. So when this connective tissue, when the gum tissue gets damaged, it takes a lot longer to heal. They have uh, tooth instability, crowding of the teeth. So, so lots of dental issues in general. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I like is, I looked at all sorts of dental gels. This was the one I found, it's called Live Fresh. Um, it's, um, it has, it's gluten-free and all that stuff. But the main thing is most toothpastes are abrasive. So if you go and buy a regular toothpaste, like Colgate or something, they're abrasive. They kind of scrape down your teeth. The last thing you want to do is scrape down a tooth that already has a thin enamel. This one is a chelating agent. So it sort of grabs things off. Um, and so helps repair connective, helps repair gum tissue, prevents it from getting more damaged. <clears throat> I think you can buy this on Amazon. Um, anyway, Local anesthetics, we all know local anesthetics don't work at these patients. And I don't know if it's only limited to lidocaine or other forms of, uh, uh, of lo local anesthetics. 
There's some anecdotal literature on carbocane or mepivacaine that works well in EDS. Uh, so it's worth looking at that. Uh, again, when you ask them like, hey, when you had dental work, did it work for you? If it didn't, then document it well, because dentists don't believe that. And you'll have to really talk to the dentist and say like, look, if you're planning on doing something major, these patients are not gonna work out well on local anesthetics. So moving on to the spine, uh, tethered cord syndrome. Uh, this is to show you what, uh, so this is the normal um, picture of the spine. It ends, the conus ends at L1, and then after that you have the phylum, which goes all the way down. Um, but in tethered cord syndrome, what happens is that the phylum is, uh, is attached over here down to the sacrum. So the conus gets pulled down. So it's now at L3 instead of being at L1. And what happens is that over time, this phylum gets inflamed and it becomes second. It gets it has a fatty de deposition on it. So on an MRI, you can see thickened phylum. But most often what you see is actually the conus uh, being lowering, lowering down from L1 to L3. That's what you see most often in these patients. Now, just as a note on MRIs and tethered cord syndrome, um, if you talk to the neuroradiologist, they'll say it's not true. They don't, they don't think, they don't believe that you can identify tethered cord on an MRI. <clears throat> Most radio, neuroradiologists I've talked to don't agree. They, they agree that you can't see it on an MRI. So, you, you know, again, I get pushed back from neurosurgeons saying, well, the MRI was normal. Um, so you go by symptoms and that's what medicine is all about. You go by history and physical examination. So these patients present with a very non-specific low back pain, they have a neurogenic bladder, and I'll explain that to you. They have lower extremity symptoms. They are diffuse, severe pain to their lower extremities. There's, they have um, almost, they almost have muscle spasms, Charlie horse-like symptoms. Um, they have a history, or they're actually doing toe walking and heel walking. Um, have them walk in your office, and you can see if they're doing toe walking or heel walking, or else just look at the bottom of their shoe, and you'll see where the wear pattern on their on the soles of their shoes. Uh, a neurogenic bladder is uh, when they have increased frequency, so they go often, uh, they have urgency, but this is the important one. They have a sense of incomplete emptying of the bladder. They don't, after they've gone to the bathroom, they still are not sure if they've really emptied their bladder. Uh, and then I don't see incontinence as often. Uh, it's not as common. So I'm gonna move down to the chest wall. Uh, Patients with EDS don't often complain about chest wall pain, surprisingly. Well, they don't complain of pain unless you actually ask them. But um, so they'll often complain of what is called air hunger. So they have a feeling that they have forgotten to take a breath. And they'll say, you know, I sigh a lot. And, you know, people get annoyed because they think I'm bored or something. Uh, they have pain from their ribs. And then, of course, obviously, there's nothing going on in their heart and lungs. Now, one of the things to remember is that each rib makes three joints at the spine. The costovertebral joint junction is made up of three joints. And like all joints, these joints are prone to subluxing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the theory behind uh, patients presenting with air hunger or presenting with rib pain is that, you know, we'll talk about joint position sense in a few minutes, but what happens is when you, ins when you, when, when you do an inspiration, all the ribs move up simultaneously and the diaphragm moves down at the same time. All this has to be well synchronized. Now, if they have poor proprioception, then what happens is some ribs are gonna move faster than other ribs. And they end up having muscle spasms in the intercostal muscles over here. So if this rib is moving a little faster than this rib, then these muscles get pulled and they wind up having intercostal muscle pain. And that's the rib pain we are talking about, otherwise diagnosed as costochondritis. So it's essentially, there's nothing wrong with their ribs. Uh, it's just that they have poor proprioception. Of course, um, in case of rib subluxation, then it's an excruciating pain that they'll present with in the back and the, the posterior chest wall. <clears throat> um, one of the muscles that you, that's used for respiration is called the quadratus lumborum. That's the muscle that lives in the lower back. And it's got nothing to do with the back. It doesn't support the back in any way. It just lives over there. That's the thing. And oftentimes these patients complain of pain in the lower back and you can easily palpate the quadratus lumborum or known as the QL muscle and you'll find spasms there. So how do you treat this? 
Um, breathing exercises, and I put in some uh, breathing exercises here. The easiest one is you have them lie on their back, uh, bend their knees. I couldn't get this guy to bend his knees, but you have them bend their knees. Uh, you put a book um, on, their, on their belly button and have them breathe in and out for 20 minutes, lifting the book up and down. <clears throat> Surprisingly, you'll get a question from patients asking you, what should be the weight of the book, or which book, all right? And I actually, there's an answer to that. Um, it's called the thunk test. So you take a book and you drop it, and if you hear a thunk, that's the book to use. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding, I get this question a lot, which book to use? <laughs> um, anyway, the other one is that they can have, the move the diaphragm up and down, and that's singing in high low tones and low tones. Um, and again, they can, they can play a wind instrument. So these are some of the things that can be done to help them. These sound simple. These are not fancy treatments. Uh, they sound ridiculously simple, but each one of these helps in the improving the quality of life of these patients. So let's move on to pain in the arms and EDS. Again, pain in the arms and the EDS is, of course, the shoulder joint, I told you, is a very, very uh, unstable joint. The reason being that we need more mobility there. We need a greater range of motion. And so they do develop laxity of the joint, shoulder joint. Uh, and then what happens is when the shoulder joint becomes lax, the muscles from the rotator cuff group around it spasm up and tighten up. And then they also uh, develop what is called thoracic outlet syndrome. It's an, I was so surprised when I first started treating patients with ADS, I was seeing such a high incidence of thoracic outlet syndrome in these patients. And that's why I really need you to understand what it is. Um, these patients will present with uh, upper back pain, pain going into the interscapular region. It radiates down the arm. It's usually in a specific dermatomal distribution, usually, not always. Um, <clears throat> and so just to refresh your memory on what thoracic outlet syndrome is, there are three types. There's a neurogenic type, there's a venous type, and there's an arterial type. Uh, the neurogenic type being the most common. Uh, this, is, this is the first rib. Uh, in some, some cases, this would be the cervical rib, but this is the first thoracic rib. And then you have the clavicle over here. Between the clavicle and the first rib, or this rib, there's a gap. And in this gap lives, lives the neurovascular bundle that goes down the arm. So you have the brachial plexus, you have the veins and the artery going down the arm. Now, if this shoulder joint is unstable, if this clavicle is unstable, the shoulder joint is unstable, a couple of things happen. The clavicle shut, pushes down on the first rib, squeezing these, this neurovascular bundle. The scalene muscle gets tightened up. So it squeezes the neurovascular bundle over here. And then this pectoralis minor muscle also goes into a spasm, squeezing these, this neurovascular bundle. That's, so these patients often present with symptoms down the arm. There are very basic clinical exams that I can't go into that right now, but there are some basic clinical exams on how to examine a patient with thoracic outlet syndrome clinically in the office. They call the Halstead Maneuver, the Adson's Test, and all those. Um, so, these, so these patients often present with pain in their neck, um, I'm sorry, pain in the upper back, down the arm. Uh, the treatment, again, is start with the most basic one, kinesio taping it. Uh, uh, you can Botox. Um, so they'll try and Botox the pectoralis minor muscle. They'll Botox the scalene muscles to see if they can open up this gap a little bit more. Um, in ADS, it doesn't really help a lot, Botox. Um, but in the non-ADS population, it can actually help to about 70% of the patients. So I really recommend trying that. If, if all else fails, then it's uh, surgery, so surgery of the first rib or the cervical rib and releasing the pectoralis minor muscle. And the kind of surgeon that does this is a thoracic surgeon or a vascular surgeon. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of kinesio taping of the shoulder joint, uh, but then we have a wonderful kinesiologist over here, so I can't. Um, so I just want to touch a little bit on joint position sense or proprioception. Proprioception is essentially what happens is that we have sensors in our joints, all our joints, sensors in our joints, sensors in our ligaments, tendons, muscles, that send back a signal as to the position of that particular joint. So if I have, if I bring out my thumb, if I, if I need to scratch an itch on my finger, on my head, um, I can do that without looking at it. 
I don't need to look at the itch. I don't need to look at my hand and I can zero in on the itch. It's because there are sensors in my hand that tell my brain constantly where my hand is. And that's the reason we can walk, we can balance ourselves, we can walk without falling or tipping over, or it also protects us from hyperextending our joints. And that's called joint position sense. Um, some of the exercises for joint position sense are using, they're very, actually they're very, they're kind of fun exercises. Uh, balance board or the wobble board, stork standing, which is you stand on one leg, you do it with your eyes open and then you do it with your eyes closed. Uh, stand up pedal board, sitting on an exercise ball, exercising in water, like treading or water. Um, so the, I actually modeled for this picture over here. <laughs> that's me, just so you think, that's not me, that's me. Uh, that's the standard paddle board. I, the reason I put this picture is because I've had this question before. People have asked me, what is a standard, standard paddle board? And that's what it is. Um, <clears throat> they, what else helps happens is, so here's the thing. The brain, when it can't get feedback from your joints, what it does is it gets feedback from the receptors, the sensors on the skin. They, there are four different mechanoreceptors on the skin. And so the brain uses those mechanoreceptors to get a sense of where the joint is. And so um, wearing something that is skin tight, doesn't have to be super tight, just skin tight, is enough to give you an idea, give the brain a good feedback. This is one of the compression garments that I like to recommend is mainly because it has built-in reinforcement. I mean, they, they, this re, so it reinforces the knee joint. It has a hip joint reinforced. So it's kind of a kinesiotape built into the garment itself. Plus it's compressive. compressive. This company actually makes it for um, athletes. So is joint position sense only limited to ADS? No, um, toddlers have it, it's undeveloped. So that's why toddlers, when they first learn to walk, they fall a lot. Elderly fall a lot is because they have joint degeneration. So the concept that elderly fall a lot is because they have muscle weakness is not exactly true. They also have poor joint position sense. Um, athletes lose it because of joint trauma, post joint replacement surgery. So again, you can see that there. Now, so one example of poor joint position sense is in the hands. So oftentimes when ADSS, this is an actual uh, we, this person was holding a pen and you can see she's white knuckling it over here. Um, she's using a lot of fingers to hold a simple pen. And so this is how they do it because they're not getting any feedback. So they overcompensate by holding it tight. They use a lot of fingers to hold it. And then the other thing is when they write, they press down really hard. They actually write right through paper. And so they emboss right through paper and that's called poor haptic feedback. You know how on your iPhone, when you hit a button, you get this little buzz, that's called a haptic feedback. So when we write, we get this little scratch on paper and that's our haptic feedback. On top of that, they have loose joints, hyperlax joints. So it's like having jello fingers trying to hold something. So that you need an extra amount of strength. The point I'm trying to make over here is that these patients to hold something simple, even like a hairbrush or a fork or a spoon, have to use a tremendous amount of energy. And so they, their hands start to hurt. And this is an example where they can uh, work around is, for kids, they can use a foam tube, you can get that. It's a dense foam tube that goes around a pen or a fork or a knife. Uh, but for non, if you're not holding something, then of course you can use fingerless compression gloves. These are freely available everywhere. They're actually called arthritis gloves. Uh, fingerless compression gloves. Again, you're using the same mechanism I said was using the mechanoreceptors on the skin. Um, for stabilizing the hyperlax joints, these are uh, ring splints. So these ring splints, what they do is they, they keep the joint from, from hyperlaxing too much, from hyperextending too much. So that brings me to this question about splinting and braces in general. Um, what do braces and splints do? They maintain the joint in a neutral position. So for example, if I hyperextend my elbow too much, it, the joint, or the, the brace would just keep it in a neutral position. Um, they, they also help with joint position awareness because they cover the joint, so they help with proprioception. I usually recommend starting them gradually. You don't, don't start wearing them every uh, all day long. Start with an hour a day and then so on, progress from there, and then decrease their use as you gain strength. So the, 
the often the question that I often get is uh, braces make you weaker, so don't wear them all day long. Uh, I looked at the literature and there's zero literature on that. I couldn't find anything on it that says that. And so to me, it feels like um, <clears throat> this is one of those things that have been passed down from generation to generation of healthcare providers about a concept that was mistaken. So um, first things, the, the brace doesn't go around muscles. That's the first thing. So what happens is, that these first thing, the braces are not that tight enough to prevent muscles from moving. The second thing is the braces stabilize a joint, which makes your joints more move more efficiently. To give you an example, if I had, <laughs> there she is. Um, if I had an unstable knee joint, for example, I would limit my movement. I wouldn't use it. I would just use it. It's like using your spoons. That's one spoon I wouldn't use. And so what happens is that when you put on a brace, now your joint is much more stable. So I'm gonna use my leg even more. So there's less chance of my muscles being atrophied. The concept that braces make your muscles weak came from, I think from plaster casts was, you know, how they put a plaster cast, they actually block the use of muscles. And so these muscles atrophy, but that's not true in the case of braces. So I'm gonna jump straight down to the legs <laughs> because if, your, if your ankles, if your feet and ankles are not stable, that makes your knees unstable. And if, and your knees are unstable to start with, which then makes your hips unstable, which then throws your SI joint off, which then throws your spine off. So there's a whole Jenga tower over here, starting from the ankles all the way up. Oftentimes, now this is not just EDS, even in non-EDS patients, if they come in with back pain and I can't really figure out what the reason is, you start looking at their feet and ankles and that's where you'll get your answers. <clears throat> so how do you diagnose somebody with flat feet, or often known as pest planus? Uh, you simply eyeball them. You have them stat, stand on, a, on, a, on, on the floor and you look at them from the side, putting the whole weight on it. They have to be standing with their whole weight and you can see the loss of curvature over here. And of course, when they lift it up, then you get back the curvature. The difference in EDS is that their flatness is more in the forefoot rather than in the midfoot. So if this is the foot, when they place their foot down, it, their toes splay out. The front is the, the, the flatness is more in the front. And the point I'm making over here is that recommend using wide shoes in these cases because you need to give these toes to splay out. You need them need to give them room to splay out. Um, along with, when, when a patient comes in with flat feet or pest planus, what happens is they lose, they also, and on top of that, if you add ankle instability, they start to have a foot that looks like this from behind. These are pronated ankles. The problem with this pronated ankle is that the weight distribution, if you drop, drop a plumb line, it kind of misses the ankle joint completely. And that's where they're putting a lot of immense amount of force over here. So they also have pronation at the same time. And that's where that ankle brace comes into handy is prevents the pronation and also helps with the flat feet. So how do you exercise the muscles in the feet? And so barefoot walking, all EDSers will tell you they love walking bare feet. It's because one, of course it helps with the proprioception, but it also, helps strengthen their muscles. So when you walk bare feet, you claw the ground. And when you claw the ground, you're using the muscles in your hand. Uh, sorry, feet. Repeated rising on their tiptoes, uh, ankle raises. Uh, these are some of the exercises they can do to strengthen their feet and ankles. Um, in terms of footwear, uh, there's just one word, sneakers. That's it, sneakers. Um, anything that has a foot, Anything that has shoe, laces on it, so if this is the foot, this is the shoe, you want that shoe to grip your foot. That's the thing, no slip-ons. And <clears throat> the reason being that when you put in a, when you put in a shoe, uh, shoe insert like that, if, you're, if, you're sh if, it's not, if, if your foot is loose inside the shoe, you're not getting any benefit from it. And that's one of the reasons why I recommend shoes that have fastened. It could be Velcro, it could be shoelaces, it doesn't matter. Um, some of the newer sneakers, newer modern sneakers have a little bit of an arch built into it. So if the patient is not super flat, they might just get away without a shoe insert and just having a good sneaker, a good pair of sneakers might do the job. This is a company, uh, I, I like this company is 
See, I'm recommending all these companies, but I have really zero financial interest in them. <laughs> Just clarifying again. Um, this is a German company actually, and they it's, it's kind of custom designed. Uh, and I found of all the shoe inserts, um, I, I use shoe inserts, so I, I have a pretty good experience on them. And I found these to be one of the good ones. Um, you, can, you can actually buy them on Amazon. They're not very expensive. And of course, if you want to buy the really expensive ones, then you can go to the podiatrist who can give you custom made ones. But then again, they're the same. Remember, shoe inserts don't have a lot of a life. They are inside your shoe, it's hot, it's an immense amount of pressure. So they don't last more than a year, six months to a year. So moving up from feet and ankles, uh, I'm gonna go up to the knees. Uh, so the patella is usually very unstable and you can see that uh, you have the patient lie down and you can see the patella slide from side to side. Um, they have hyperextension of their knees. So how do you look for hyperextension in the knees? The, way, the best way is um, you have them stand and then you kind of have them lean forward a little bit. So when they lean forward a little bit, it, forces them to push their knees back. Because people with high, uh, unstable knees are very afraid of pushing their knees back. So in, when you're testing it, when you want to figure out if they have hyperextension, that's one of the ways to do it. If not, then they can lie down and you can simply lift up their, uh, lift up their leg from the ankle and you can see the hyperextension. So this patient has hyperextension of both knees, this one being the, more, the left one being worse. This is a, uh, taping technique that was published in 2015 uh, for EDS, for, the, for EDSs. I'm not going to read this all through, but this is a technique that I like using uh, in my patients for um, uh, knee joints. Uh, <clears throat> now, in terms of braces, uh, what, what should you be looking in a brace? Uh, it should have a, so you see the problem with the leg is it's conical in shape. It's thicker up here, it's thinner down here. So they should have straps up here. It should have a strap down here. It should have a strut over here with a hinge to prevent it from hyperextending. And then a donut over here to prevent the patella from slipping around. Uh, this is one model that I used to use. I don't use it anymore. The reason being that you have to pull it up and people with hyperlax fingers can't pull it up. It's a really difficult job. So there's another model that's, this has become more popular. It's got a really uh, spooky name uh, called Gripper, uh, but it, it's a wrap around. So it wraps around the knee joint. Uh, and I think I get better compliance with this one than with the one, the one previous one I showed you. You know, a lot of them are kids and kids don't want to be spending an hour putting on their braces. Uh, one of the mix, one of the commonly missed causes of leg pain is the proximal tibiofibular joint, um, and I, I I talk about this a lot. And the reason being is that it's missed, of obviously. Uh, I'm going to show you a little. This is what they present with pain on the lateral aspect of the leg, going down to the foot, and they often have a gait that's a kind of a shuffling gait. It's a, they can hear them scrape. So you can, their family members will tell you, yeah, I can hear them. Uh, when she walks, I can hear her scrape. And oftentimes if they've been walking for some time, they start to trip on their toes. So they start to develop symptoms of foot drop. Uh, this is the anatomy over here. So you can see uh, this is the tibia, this is the fibula. This joint is called the proximal tibiofibular joint. It's also known as a poor cousin of the knee joint because orthopedic surgeons are not interested in it. Um, so this, the, the thing is the peroneal nerve winds around the neck of the fibula and then it goes down to the leg. And it, that's, the, that's the nerve that's responsible for lifting your foot up as you take your first step. Uh, when this joint uh, subluxes, and why would this joint sublux? That's the question. Remember the tibia and the fibula, when they go down to the ankle, they form the ankle joint. So that's the mortis. So this is the tibia, this is the fibula, that's the ankle joint. So if my ankle joint subluxes, what it does is it splits apart these two bones, which in my case is okay. I don't see it as much, but if you have loose connective tissue, when this joint, when the ankle joint twists around, when it subluxes, so they roll their ankles. When they roll their ankles, these two bones separate. And when they separate, then it translates all the way from the ankle up to the tibiofibular joint and the nerve is affected and they get inflammation of the nerve. 
If you examine them in the office, you will not see symptoms of uh, dropped foot. But once they've been walking for some time, you'll start to notice that their gait becomes slower and slower. They're starting to shuffle more and they're starting to trip more. Sometimes you can have them walk around in your office and look at them. Sometimes they'll give it to you on the history. If not, if you look at the sole of the shoe, you'll see the wear pattern on the, on the sole of their foot. <clears throat> the, the treatment here is, um, the treatment here is, of course, you look at the ankle joint. And if their ankle joint is subluxing, if they have a very lax ankle joint, stabilize the ankle joint, and that might just stabilize this joint over here. Um, I don't really recommend surgery. It's not a good idea to do surgery in these patients. But again, if it's, if it's not getting better, then surgery is one of the options. Um, but you can also, um, as a diagnostic measure, even do a peroneal nerve block. It's a really simple any pain specialist can do that. It's a really simple nerve block, and that'll at least give you a diagnostic value as to see like, okay, maybe that's the source of the problem. So bringing, that brings me down to the subject on tendonitis and bursitis. Why do people have tendonitis and bursitis? Um, I just want to clarify, bursitis is not a disease. Tendonitis is not a disease. It's, a, it's an indicator of something else that's wrong. In, in exceptional cases, it can be a disease. We won't get into some of the uh, autoimmune conditions. It can be a disease, but let's talk about ADS. Um, so let's look at this picture over here. You can see um, <clears throat> this is the joint, and there's a muscle that forms into a tendon that goes over the joint. All muscles and tendons travel over joints because that's their job. They have to move these joints. In order to prevent this muscle from abrading, there's a small pocket of fluid over here called the bursa. And so this muscle can then this muscle can then move smoothly over the joint. The tendon has a sleeve over it that helps it from helps it from sliding. What happens is should this joint, so should the bones move, shift for any reason, or if the patient's posture is off for some reason, then what happens is an extraordinary pressure on the bursa, on the muscle and the tendon. And so the bursa starts to get inflamed and the tendon starts to get inflamed because there's an extraordinary amount of pressure. So this is what results in bursitis and tendonitis, like the trochanteric bursa, all these kind of bursas. So if somebody comes in with a trochanteric bursitis, start looking at, okay, what's the cause over here? Instead of just shooting a steroid injection into the bursa, which does help temporarily, but look at the feet, look at the ankles, look at the knees. Is there something wrong with their gait that's making this bursa act up? So treatment lies in correcting the underlying position. So you um, correct, brace, correct bracing to align the joints, correct posture, especially when they're standing. And you know, what happens is um, if I have pain in my left knee joint and I often find myself standing in my right leg. And obviously one day my trochanteric burst on the right is gonna start acting up. Um, avoid repetitive use of that joint, maintain proper balance. Sacral leg joint pain is a very common cause of pain in these uh, patients, uh, especially in women. Um, it's usually, this is the pain pattern in the SI joint. Uh, it's not, this, this diagram is not that accurate. It's not in the gluteal region, it's a little more medial. So the pain is somewhere in this region. It goes down, it can go down the leg, but usually, rarely does it ever go down below the knee. It usually doesn't go below the knee. And in some cases they can present with pain in the groin. Now, in the EDS population, see, there's a difference between having SI joint pain in the, in the non-EDS population versus in the EDS population. In the non-EDS population, it's usually because of an inflammatory cause in the SI joint. So doing a steroid injection of the SI joint might make a difference. But in EDS, it's not inflammation. It's more mechanical. And in those cases, um, you can look for an apparent leg length discrepancy, like I showed you before. What if there is um, an issue on one side of the leg? What if there's, you know, instability on one side of the leg? Their pelvis tilts when their pelvis tilts. So when a pelvis tilts, what happens is our body weight comes down the sacrum, splits into two. Half of it goes down this side. Half of it goes down this side. But if your pelvis is tilted, then one side is going to take more weight, and the other one is going to take less weight. And then eventually this SI joint is gonna start squeaking. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem here. So correcting that leg length discrepancy can make a difference. This is a temporary solution. It's called um, an SI joint brace. In the old days, we used to have what is called an SI belt. 
which is really just an ordinary belt um, and it really didn't work for us. But this, this is one of the belts that I find it does help somewhat. Fixing the SI joint instability is a very difficult problem. And so I kind of tend to use this a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to discuss a lot about parts and dysautonomia because you have, the, have an awesome cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, who's going to talk about it, Dr. Maxwell. Um, but just to give you an idea, I'm, I'm going to talk about parts of dysautonomia in terms of how it affects pain and function. Uh, I just wanted to um, explain, Dr. Clark said a very nice thing, which, I've, which I don't hear often is, we're not looking at the number on the pain, we are looking at function. And that's the whole goal here. In my, at least in my case, I don't ask a number. I don't care about what your number is. I'm more interested in the function. Are you functioning? If you're not functioning, it doesn't matter. You might have two out of 10 pain as if you're not functioning. And you could have nine or 10, and if you're functioning, you're all set. So anyway, dysautonomia is dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. One of the more common, it's got a whole slew of conditions that fall under dysautonomia. But the more common one that we see in um, ADS is called POTS, or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, these patients present with fainting, dizziness, um, heart racing, palpitations, fatigue, headaches. Uh, they have difficulty maintaining their body temperature, brain fog, and this constant feeling of anxiety. That's the one that I wanted to bring up, was this constant feeling of anxiety. Uh, those are websites that you can find some more information on, the Disarmy and National and EDS Awareness have a lot more. In, they have some really amazing videos on that. So the problem is that this constant feeling of dizziness makes these patients feel unstable. And so laxity, of the, and on top of that, they have laxity of the joints, makes, which makes them tighten their muscles reflexly. This constant overuse of muscles adds to their pain and fatigue. One of the things is that these patients are often said, oh, it's all anxiety, you're all just anxious. And it's this anxiety, and the funny thing is that it's not, they're not anxious. And if you ask these patients and say like, do you really feel anxious when you feel, like, do you think there's a, if there's, you know, patients will tell you that there's no reason to feel anxious and all of a sudden they're feeling really anxious. And I don't use the word anxious, I use the word jumpy. Does it make you feel jumpy? And they'll often tell you, yeah, there's nothing going on. And then they just have a baseline level of anxiety um, or jumpiness. <clears throat> and the, what, the reason being that they have a hyperactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Their sympathetic nervous system is dialed up all the way. So, <clears throat> but there's just one last thing uh, I didn't, um, you know, POTS can be also associated with other conditions like Sjogren's syndrome, antiphospholipid syndrome, and other autoimmune conditions. Um, it can be seen in autoimmune conditions where they, these patients develop antibodies to adrenergic receptors. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, mast cells are these little fellows that live in our body. They live in the tissue, and they have an important role in inflammation. And they're part of the immune system. They're like the National Guard. They, they're really not doing anything at most times uh, until they're activated. And <clears throat> what happens is these mast cells are, these mast cells are actually granular. And just to show you, they're huge, humongous. This is a red cell to show you a comparison. And they're granular. These granules contain, among other chemicals, histamine and heparin. Uh, they have cytokines, they have all sorts of chemicals in there. <clears throat> the problem in mast cell activation syndrome is that these cells are inappropriately triggered. They're misbehaving mast cells. If you want to explain to someone what mast cell is, there are two words. One is your mast cells are misbehaving. And the second one is it always feels like you have flu. It always makes them feel like they have flu. They feel cold, they feel yucky, they feel tired, um, and, and they feel nauseous. <clears throat> Now, just to be clear, not to be confused with mastocytosis. So now, of course, it's a little better when people Google the word mast cell activation syndrome. But up till a year or two ago, when they Googled that, I would get these panic phone calls saying, it says, talks a lot about mastocytosis, and it's not mastocytosis. So just to be clear, assure the patients not to worry, it's not mastocytosis. Uh, again, it's rashes, hives, itchy. They have fatigue. They're tired. 
remember we talked about this in POTS also. Patients with POTS also have fatigue and tiredness. They have muscle pain, bone pain, joint pain, abdominal pain, palpitations, presyncope. It actually worsens symptoms of dysautonomia. Uh, they are flushing after a hot shower. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about the pain part of it. Think of mast cell as a condition that causes diffuse inflammation in the body. So anything that's, you, so for example, right now, I don't have pain in any part of my body. If I get a mast cell reaction, if my mast cells start misbehaving, everything is gonna hurt uniformly. Now, if I have a problem with my left knee, if my left knee is painful, is arthritic or whatever it is, I have a pre-existing pain in there, that joint is gonna hurt more when they have a mast cell reaction. Uh, dermal dermatographism, I wanted to show you that. Everybody knows that. So these are some of the, some of the chemicals, mediators that are released from mast cells. And you can see a lot of them there. Um, they are lipid mediators, they are cytokines, um, they are, there's histamine, proteases, all sorts of chemicals. The problem with testing from mast cell is it's not reliable. You have to catch these mast cells when they're misbehaving. And that's the thing, they misbehave and then they go back. It's a matter of seconds. So I personally don't re rely on mast cell testing a lot, but what will happen is if you diagnose someone with mast cell based on your clinical exam, and then they get, get some testing done, they'll be told like, I'm sorry, but your, your test results are normal. Mm -hmm. The testing is positive in about 30% of cases. Um, one of the levels that they look at is serum tryptase. But just so you know, we don't know what normal tryptase levels are. That's the thing. So we don't know if they're abnormal or not. So unless, of course, you do serial measurements, <clears throat> you'll see um, tryptase levels. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there is one test you can do. If the patient has had <clears throat> a biopsy, a GI biopsy, <clears throat> you can have the pathologist do a CD11 stain for mast cells. And ask, what I do is I ask the pathologist to comment on the, on the number of mast cells per high power field and the morphology of the mast cells. The reason being is that in the beginning when I used to ask them for a CD117, I would get back a report saying, oh, they were all fine. They were not, they were not excessive mast cells. But when you ask them for the number of mast cells per high power field, you'll find, oh, there were 25 of them in per high power field, which is pretty high. Um, and then you ask for the morphology. These mast cells are often spindle shaped or they, are, they have an abnormal shape to them. And that kind of gives you an idea that these are, um, now this is a pretty reliable test to do. So obviously I don't send them for an actual biopsy, but if they happen to be having Almost all EDS patients have GI issues. And the first thing a gastroenterologist will do is do an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. And they can, if they pull up some biopsies, you can have those stained. The treatment is, um, there's in three parts. The first part is antihistamines. So femotidine, um, I use this, uh, femotidine is an H2, H2 blocker, but I use clemastine, which is an H1 blocker. It's an old, old, old antihistamine. Um, the reason I like using it is because it helps pain also. That's the thing. Clemastine helps pain. In fact, right now, there's some really good data out there that it helps patients with multiple sclerosis. And so it's, the company is getting all excited about it. They pulled it out from the over-the-counter market, but you can do get it as a prescription. So that's what, otherwise you can just use Zyrtec, Claritin, any one of those over-the-counter, um, as long as they're not super sedating. The second part of the treatment for mast cell activation syndrome is mast cell stabilizers. And there are three of them. Um, the first one is quercetin, uh, about 1,000 milligrams a day. This is over the counter. The second one is ketotifen. And the third one is chromolin. Uh, chromolin, you can use it either oral or as a nebulized form, whichever way. But so you now have anti antihistamines, then you have the mast cell stabilizers. And then the third part, which is actually the most important part of the treatment is to find the trigger. What's the trigger? And the way I look at it is that you can get triggers in three ways. One, you can get it by breathing it. The second is by eating it. And the third is by applying it. So let's leave out the applying it because obviously if you apply something and you get a reaction, you know what's the problem. But eating it is a bigger problem. The foods that we're eating are not the same foods that my grandmother had. 
the rice, the wheat, the grains we are having are not the ones that God intended. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, then there are binding agents that can do it. There are all kinds of stuff and these drugs that are being mixed in there, not to mention they cause cancer, which we, we just read about Zyantac. Um, anyway, so there are inactive ingredients can do it. So if you have a patient and you prescribe a drug and then the patient comes back with a bizarre answer, like this is a bizarre reaction, doesn't make sense at all. Like for example, propranolol, I remember this patient last week, I gave her propranolol and she had this really weird reaction which didn't make any sense. Turns out that she was reacting to one of the ingredients in propranolol, the, the preservative or the binding agent. Um, you can also use uh, leukotriene inhibitors like Singulair. There's something called a low histamine diet. And so that's the first thing I would say, try a, the first thing is actually I try for a gluten-free diet and then I go for a low histamine diet. So you're looking for triggers. There are other triggers um, like dairy can do it, meats can do it. Uh, I remember the, if a, if a patient is gluten-free, as has a reaction to gluten, the cow that ate the, the grain is the, is the beef that you eat. And so you're now getting more gluten from beef. That's the problem. Um, I've had patients where they had to get, get their beef from a specific butcher because he was giving his cows gluten-free grain. It's kind of crazy, but it does, it happens. Um, so some of these are the preventative measures you can use. In terms of breathing, um, from in, in the cold countries, our houses are sealed, guaranteed there's some mold growing somewhere and under the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink somewhere. Look for those. Um, there's, there's mold growing in the ventilation duct, look for those. Uh, again, you can use a room HEPA air filter, that will make a difference. Uh, if they're having a flare up, have them do a nasal saline wash and that kind of also helps. So I'm just gonna to briefly touch on abdominal pain. Uh, it's extremely common in ADS. In fact, one of the first studies that came out was from the gastroenterology clinic in the UK on ADS. Uh, lots of reasons for these patients to have uh, GI issues. One, from the ADS itself, because the, the wall of the intestines are loose and lax. Uh, the POTS can do it. Remember, anything that is automatically controlled in the body is affected. Mast cell activation syndrome can do it. You know, mast cells are part of the defense mechanism. So they tend to accumulate on the surfaces of the body, like the skin, the mucous membrane of the mouth, the eyes, the conjunctiva, the lining of the intestine, the bladder. So oftentimes these patients have symptoms of interstitial cystitis. They have vulvodynia, they have GI issues, all because of this. Um, and of course, acid reflux from mast cell activation syndrome. Now, this is a low FODMAP diet excuse me, and this, it's not been published, but the literature is going to be published soon. I've talked to the gastroenterologists who are doing this study in the UK, and they, they're finding some really amazing results with using a low FODMAP diet. Um, I can't tell you what it sounds, but you can, you can read what low FODMAP stands for over here, um, but it's very common. You can see it. It's, if you go online, you'll find a low FODMAP diet. I put in some some information on here, what a low FODMAP diet is, it's in three stages. Um, so the problem is that this dysfunction of the intestines in these patients, so their intestines aren't moving well, they have gastroparesis, they have uh, small intestinal dysmotility. What happens is that in the small intestine, you have a thousand different bacteria. In the large intestine, you have 10,000 different bacteria. And if the intestines aren't moving well, these guys from the large intestine creep over to the small intestine and they overpopulate it. And that's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. These patients present with abdominal pain, bloating, gassy. They're very gassy uh, and weakness. <clears throat> uh, some of the problems these patients start to develop is mostly absorption. So they have vitamin deficiencies, they have vitamin folate excess, iron deficiency and low protein. Uh, now, the test for finding out diagnosing SIBO is a breath test. It's a very simple test. You can get a home kit or you can, the gastroenterologist can do it in the office. They look for two gases. They look for hydrogen and methane. And again, if the methane is elevated, one of the drugs that actually helps us is lower statin or red rice yeast. <clears throat> um, but again, the official treatment is to give them antibiotics. There are specific antibiotics that are used by 
by um, gastroenterologists like Zafaxamine. But there's no point in treating SIBO unless you've treated the underlying movement disorder in the industry. In, so if they have dysautonomia, treat that first. If they have mast cell, treat that first before moving on to treating the actual SIBO. Mm -hmm. Because if you treat the SIBO with an antibiotic or, or red rice yeast, we're not gonna make any progress because it's just gonna come back again. Um, these are some other drugs that I like for GI motility, uh, Resolor, Ibergo. You know, Resolor is not available in the US. I actually order it from Canada. Um, Ibergo, uh, Mastinon, Erythromycin. So again, the treatment is avoid simple carbohydrates. Uh, think of pureed foods in these patients. This is, a, this is a little bit out of the box in this case. Uh, we have no, I don't want you to, uh, I just want, I'm just trying to educate you on this because we have no conclusive evidence that this is common in ADS. But we're starting around the country, people who treat ADS are starting to see this more and more. It's called MALS, Median Arcuate Ligament Syndrome. Um, these patients present with belly pain. It's usually epigastric pain. Uh, the pain is over here. Um, it's sitting upright makes the pain worse. Sitting on their side, uh, lying down on their side, either side, or especially lying on lying prone decreases their pain. Uh, what happens is there's a ligament called the median arcuate ligament, and this is the celiac artery that that supplies blood to the large to the small intestine, and along the, with that you have nerves that go to it, the celiac plexus. And median arcuate ligament syndrome, for whatever reason, this artery gets squeezed, it gets pinched. It pinches not only just the artery, but also the nerve. And so these patients present with severe acute abdominal pain. It's mostly in the epigastric region. In fact, if you put your thumb on the epigastric region, um, they, they, you can reproduce the pain that they have. They really wince out loud, loudly. What I do is I'll, do, I'll, I'll put my thumb here and I'll say, look, I'm pressing on point number one and let me know how much it hurts. And then I'll press on two or three random places just so as to make sure that they're not having, they don't, they're not just wincing because I'm pushing. And oftentimes you'll find this pain over there in the med, median, epi, in, the, in the epigastric region. The pain gets worse when they're upright, gets better when they're lying on the lateral side. The, unfortunately, the treatment for this is surgical decompression. <laughs> um, it is, and I just want to put a disclaimer in this. We don't know how it's associated with ADS. We don't even know if it's common in ADS or not, but, but more and more physicians who are treating patients with ADS, gastroenterologists who treat ADS are starting to understand that there is an, uh, there is an association. So again, it's getting the conversation started. Um, ADS in children, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that I, is very close to my heart. Uh, patients, you know, kids have dislocated joints, chronic body weight pain, easy bruising, abdominal pain, fatigue, and even unidentified bleeding. Remember, mast cells are, these, they have mast cell activation syndrome. They feel sick. They're tired all the time. Mast cells release heparin. Heparin can cause bleeding issues in these patients. To an ER physician, this looks very suspicious. And it looks like child abuse. And so this is where the problem comes in. It's very misunderstood by healthcare providers who have no idea what ADS is. Um, and they often get a psych diagnosis by untrained professionals. Um, usually it's the intern or the resident who diagnoses them, which is so annoying. Um, so I tell patients to be careful where you're going, have your pediatrician on board, have your team on board before any of these things can happen so that should this situation arise, your pediatrician, your, your, your specialist will support you in the background. Um, this actually I put in there for uh, patients. Uh, I do recommend service dogs. Um, they are invaluable, especially to kids who are in that age, the teenage group that they're now going on to college. It makes a big difference to them. Uh, believe it or not, these dogs can actually sense pots. They can, they, they can sense a POTS attack, when they're starting to have a syncopal attack or a pre-syncope attack, they can sense that. They protect their limbs as, uh, to, from being touched. You know, one of the problems with kids in school is that they don't, other kids don't care and they bump into you and now you have a dislocated knee. And so they do help. Uh, just as a warning, uh, peacocks, lizards, and alligators are not service animals. <laughs>
I'm not joking, that has happened. <laughs> that has happened. A lady showed up at the airport with a peacock. Um, <clears throat> So uh, exercises for EDS, uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on that. So th the trick here is to, you know, the joints, the ligaments aren't doing a good job, right? So now you depend on your muscles. So strengthening your muscles would help a lot. Um, building on proprioception, I showed you some proprioception exercises. The, the key point here is that it should be a low grade exercise, but it should be every single day instead of doing a ton of exercise one day and then not being able to exercise for the next two weeks. That's more harmful. Um, avoid joint loading um, and focus on strengthening and start very low. So if they can, if a, say a patient can do 10 reps, <laughs> I'll tell them, look, stick to four reps. Don't do 10 reps. Even if you're having a good day, stick to four reps. And then after a few weeks, go up by one more rep. After a few more rep, weeks, go up one more rep, but stay within your limits, <clears throat> but progress really, really slowly. Keep within your range of motion. So if, if that's the range of motion this, this person can have, I always tell them to stay under it. And the way I explain it is, like if you can bring your arm up here, I tell them to stop short. Same thing with their knees. If they're being able to, they can stand. I ask them to just break their knee a little bit. As, so you don't want to exceed or go to their limit a range of motion. This applies a lot to kids who are in school, teenagers, because they're in sports activities which, in, which can overstretch their uh, ligaments. Um, exercising in water is invaluable. Uh, why? Because one, the pressure of the water gives their, triggers their mechanoreceptors, so they get this proprioception feeling over there. The second is it takes the load off their joints. So now you're one-tenth your weight, so it takes the load of the joints, so they can uh, exercise much better but I don't recommend swimming. This is harmful for their neck. This is harmful for their shoulders. So if they are going to swim, if they want to do some aerobic exercises, running in water is one of the best ones. Um, otherwise doing a breast stroke would be the way to do it. <clears throat> Kinesio taping, uh, there's a new tape that's just come out. It's been actually de designed uh, for patients with ADS, keeping patients with ADS in mind. Uh, they worked very hard. They worked actually for five years on finding the right adhesive because one of the problems with Kinesio tape is the brands that you get in the market, they all react to uh, because they're mast cells. So, so far, it's, it's kind of new to the market. So far, we're getting really good feedback. So I wanted to mention that to you. But this, there's somebody who's going to be talking about kinesiology. kinesiology so I, I'm going to skip that part. But in general, kinesio taping is invaluable in this group of patients. It's not, when I first learned about kinesio taping, I thought it was, oh, it's just like duct tape. It's not. <laughs> okay, so don't go by my ignorance. Um, uh, it's, it's an invaluable thing to use. Um, the Thrive tape I mentioned was because um, it's, it has a far infrared kinesio tape. It is latex-free, hypoallergenic. And they actually have gone to the extent of making some videos of kinesio taping in EDS patients. And you can find that on that web website. <clears throat> um, again, it mimics um, the superficial layer of the skin is designed to stretch. So ideally, uh, these tapes can stay on for up to five days. I don't really recommend five days because after day three, it starts to kind of lose its um, value. Um, it reduces pain, improves proprioception, relaxes the muscles, stabilizes the joints. So it's got a, it's got a lot of value to it. Um, for those patients who react to kinesio tape, this is a pretty good um, cream. Most hospitals use them, they have them. It's called Cavalon. You apply a layer of that. Uh, you can use milk of magnesia also, just, you know, just the plain old milk of magnesia, let it dry and then put the tape on it. <clears throat> um, this is a technique called the Feldenkrais. I don't know if it's, um, I'm sure it's there in Canada, I'm sure. Feldenkrais is amazing. It's a very, it's a very non-threatening exercise technique. It's not, it doesn't put any strain on the joints. It doesn't, um, it's very simple, but it's very, very effective way to do it. Um, the problem that I ran into was that there are not too many practitioners trained in this technique. And so I came across this, organization called Future Life Now dash online. Um, they actually guide their patients online through video, um, through um, video chat or something like that. They can guide you 
guide patients through it. And so, they, so that, was a, that was very helpful. Uh, but Feldenkrais technique is an amazing technique. It's not stressful, it's not strenuous, and it is based on, so Moshe Feldenkrais was a man who, a, he was a physicist, and he was diagnosed with arthritis of the knee, and they told him you need a knee replacement, and he said, no way. And so he got into this whole proprioception thing, and that's, um, it's, so that's what this technique is built on, is to build on proprioception. So again, with everything, drugs, exercise, everything, start low, go slow. I mean, really, really start low. Um, this is a, uh, something that I, I actually borrowed from my, when I talk, give my neuropathic pain patients talk. It's a, it's a compound called palmitol ethanol amide. Uh, in short, it's called PEA. Um, it's just come into the US a year or two back. Uh, it was, uh, it's available in, the Europe, in Europe for a very long time. I wouldn't call it a magical cream, but it does work to a certain extent. It does help. There's a new group of drugs called CGRP uh, antagonists. So CGRP stands for calcitonin related gene. Is it available in the US, uh, the, in Canada? CGRP antagonists? Not calcitonin. So anyway, calcitonin, it won't be too long before they come here. So a calcitonin is, a CGRP is a, is a chemical that's released when there's neuroinflammation. So that causes increased blood flow, leakage of plasma or nerve endings. So it's responsible for swelling, heat, and redness. Now, right now, it's only approved for the treatment of migraines. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of similarity between migraines and neuropathic pain. And there are so far in the United States, there are three drugs that have been approved, uh, Amovig, Ajovi, and Abgality. And we're starting to see some really good results with this. And I am excited about it is because I think it can help with patients with uh, non-migraine pain, more of on the, on the line of neuropathic pain. Uh, it can make a big difference. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they'll be coming in very soon here. They're here? They're here? Yes. Oh, great, excellent. So, so, uh, so I, I kind of play a very uh, sleazy trick. What I say is like, you know, almost everyone has a migraine headache. And so I use that as, a, as an excuse. It's like, listen, you've got migraine headaches. Let's try this for your migraines. It will help your migraines. And it might even help your other pains also. So right now, the jury's out on it for other pains. Um, again, the concept of exercising is no pain, no gain. Uh, so don't get into that. Fatigue, this is a big, big deal in EDS. I mean, in fact, among the, among the kids and it's, they don't really care too much about pain. They actually care a lot about fatigue. And there's plenty of reasons to have fatigue. Uh, this EDS can cause fatigue because remember you're using your muscles constantly. Pots can cause fatigue, mast cell can cause it. Some of the drugs we use to treat them can cause fatigue, pain, poor sleep. They all, none of them sleep. And the other one is secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. This is a little bit controversial. I've talked to mitochondrial experts and they all feel that there is without a doubt, these patients are likely to have secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. You know, mitochondria to explain briefly are the powerhouse. They are the rechargeable batteries in your body. These rechargeable batteries aren't working well. That's it. They're not charging up to hundred percent. They're not discharging enough. So there are, um, there are what are called mitochondrial cocktails that you can get. A lot of them are over the counter that you can get and can make a small difference. And like I said, it's the 10% rule. So 10% from mitochondrial dysfunction, treating my, taking a mitochondrial cocktail, 10% from other things. Even if it makes a small difference to the, to the patient's quality of life, it's definitely worth it. Um, so median arcuate ligament can cause fatigue, SIBO. Um, these patients have tracheomalacia. A lot of them have tracheomalacia, sleep apnea, there's our sleep apnea lady. Uh, hormonal, so there's this question about uh, raised intracranial um, tension. So once the pressure inside the head increases, are we, uh, are because of POTS, are these, are these patients causing hypoperfusion of the pituitary gland, something on the lines of Sheehan syndrome, which can add to their fatigue, uh, sleep apnea, and non-restorative sleep in dysautonomia. <clears throat> um, I'm just gonna skip this slide for lack of time. I uh, wanted to quickly touch on medicinal marijuana. So I was glad to learn that it is uh, approved in, in, the, in Canada. Yes, the question is yes, it can be helpful in ADS. It's definitely worth trying it. Obviously stay within, within the regulatory guidelines. Um, now, 
this I get this confusion a lot about CBD. So there are two kinds of CBD. There's CBD from hemp and there's CBD from cannabis. Uh, and there's a big difference between the two. Um, CBD from marijuana is much better. It contains about 24, 20% CBD, whereas from hemp, it's only 3%. That's the difference. So, and of course, the one from hemp is more freely available and far more expensive. Um, so that's the difference where you'll find this. The less pure form of CBD, the better it is, because CBD likes to have its friends around it. But in fact, the whole plant, the medical marijuana plant, even THC likes to have its other, the terpenes and other chemicals along with it for it to work. And that's called the entourage effect. So the entourage effect works is, what it means is that it, you need these you need, you need, the CBD needs its other cannabinoids like terpenes to be included in it for it to work better. Same thing with THC, giving someone pure THC or pure CBD would won't work as well as when you combine the two, it works better. So you need the full spectrum. Um, it's a reasonable choice to try, it does work well. Again, um, you want to give a higher CBD level at a lower THC level, but having both in there is helpful. Um, Obviously, we can't vaporize, don't smoke. Uh, edibles are the best way to go. It takes a little longer, it takes about an hour, two hours for it to work. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes patients will say, I waited for half an hour, it didn't work, so I took some more, and then I took some more, and then three hours later, they are zonked out. So that's the reason why <laughs> I like, okay, you got to wait for two hours. Um, again, topically, CBD does work well. That's definitely, I can tell you that from just my experience from my patients. And the best thing is it does not, it does not affect mast cell activation syndrome. It can, yeah. it if it is, then, well, there might be exceptions to it, but also look out for if they have used something in it to the processing process, they might have added something to right? So again, so uh, THC is sedating and obviously during the daytime you want more, uh, this is wrong, um, I got this wrong. Okay, so uh, daytime you want more CBD, less THC, and same thing for sleep at night, you want more THC and less CBD. So I got those slides mixed up. This is my all time favorite drug. The reason I like this drug is because it's a disease modifying agent. All other things we talked about are disease uh, altering drugs, but this is a disease modifying agent. Low dose naltrexone has been, naltrexone is an old drug. It was approved 30 years ago for the treatment of addiction. Um, but the thing is that it, it decreases central sensitization, which is a phenomenon that patients develop in chronic pain conditions. Um, the practical part is that you can give anywhere between 1.75 to four and a half milligrams. I usually start my patients at two milligrams in the morning. Uh, because it can cause insomnia, mild headaches, it causes colorful dreams, and those are all transient. Um, they, but, but the main thing is that patients in, report increased physical activity, less pain, and you know the way they'll notice it is it's a very slow effect. So the way they'll notice it is that they can exercise more, they're much more active. Um, we do recommend that give it a trial for at least six months before deciding if it's helpful or not. Um, it used to be that you avoid all opioids and tramadol, but now there's much more evidence that you can combine it with opioids. Like if someone's on a very low, I, for myself, I, if they're on a small dose of opioid, I can, I, I don't, I feel safe enough to give them LDN, but ideally you don't want to give them LDN at the same time. Uh, we know that medications and ADS patients are extremely sensitive to them. They have abnormal responses. There's a test, a pharmacogenomic test that can be done that will give you a better idea as to how these patients metabolize their drugs. Uh, muscle relaxants, there's very limited value to it, um, except for one drug, which is not a true muscle relaxant. It's cinnamon, uh, levodopa, carbidopa and levodopa combination that helps with dystonic spasms in these patients. Um, acetaminophen or paracetamol is safe to use. It doesn't trigger mast cells uh, unless the, there's something in the, in the adjuvants. Um, it does potentiate the effect of other analgesics. Non-steroidals are not a great idea, but can be used on an as-needed basis. Uh, opioids only on a temporary basis can help. Uh, gabapentin and pregabalin are useless. They don't work. 
no, I'm not kidding. There's data. There's in fact a recent New England, uh, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published where they looked at it uh, between patients on gabapentin and not on gabapentin. There was a one point difference. One point difference. That's it. <clears throat> uh, it's, it was published last, last month. No, just one point difference. That's it. A tricyclic antidepressants are a very good choice to try. SNRIs, I don't really like, especially duloxetine, because it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare to get off that drug. Um, Melnasiprine is a good one, SNRI, to try. SSRIs don't really work on pain. They're okay for depression. Um, this is the one I was trying to tell you was... Um, Levodopa, carbidopa. I use that for muscle spasms and dystonic spasms, and it does work pretty well. It's marketed as cinnamon, uh, and the other one is magnesium, that's Epsom salt baths. They work very well. In some of the patients uh, that have, that are really fatigued and bedridden and just can't move and things are just very potsy uh, and muscles out of control, I try them on oxygen, home oxygen, 20, 20 minutes, twice a day. And it does actually amazingly help. And I wrote Professor Amuna's name because he was the first person to suggest that to me. Uh, so that's oxygen supplementation. Um, these are, this is, remember I talked to, you, talked to you about the mitochondrial cocktail? This is the combination of CoQ10, L-carnitine, and creatinine, which can help with fatigue. It's worth a try. Again, you know, it's like, no, do no harm. Will it, you know, what's the worst it can do? It may not help. At best, it might help. Um, this is the um, carbidopa I just talked to you about. And that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>